Welcome to the Model Health Show. This is fitness and nutrition expert, Sean Stevenson, and I'm so grateful for you tuning in with me today. I was just thinking about my time back in college and getting this traditional education from a traditional university. And I remember my nutrition class, which was elective, all right? Going pre-med, you didn't have to take this class, but I took a nutrition class at the very beginning. This was my second semester in college. And I remember so blatantly my professor walking into the classroom and his belly walked in first. Right? I seen his belly come through the door first. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't really understand what nutrition really meant, but I, I thought it had something to do with fitness. And it was just like, well, he's not that fit. That's, that's interesting. But here's the thing. He was doing what he was teaching. It wasn't that he was just going behind our backs and guzzling Coca-Cola. He was following the guidelines that he was teaching us, that he was supposed to teach, that he learned. And little did I know at the time that our nutrition program was funded by General Mills, all right? There's a vested interest for him to teach this information. And at that time, I was like, okay, if I'm going to really get my health together, I need to get away from the white stuff and over to the brown stuff. So I went ham, like brown rice, brown pasta, everything. It definitely was less delicious, but I thought that I was doing something better for my body. And little did I know that my allergies, my asthma symptoms that were still continuing, even though I was trying to do better, were hanging around until I pulled those things out of my diet and just ate real food. And so today we're going to talk about why that is, what happened, where did this misconception begin that we should be eating these healthy whole grains, and is there any truth to it? Are some of these whole grains actually healthy? And how are they causing so many issues today? You know, to, this is something, again, when I was in a traditional university, you know, 15, getting close to 20 years ago, this information was new and novel, and today it's like, everywhere. People are talking about this and jumping onto different new diet bandwagons, whether it's, you know, a, a vegan diet, a vegetarian diet, paleo diet, jumping on full force to try to find answers. But there are some universal principles that apply to all of those diets, whatever you choose to subscribe to, that can help you to be the healthiest, happiest version of yourself. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because at the end of the day, we need to all work together, whatever our diet beliefs are, our fundamental beliefs are, because I know that you're, if you're listening to this show, you are somebody who is a proponent of eating real food. You're somebody who's a proponent of making better choices and starting to change the way that our world is operating right now as a result. And so I commend you for that. And today I hope to really deliver you some powerful insights because we have, I'm telling you, and I shared this with him, I've read, I can't even tell you, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on health and fitness. This is one of my favorite books of all time. Like it just shot right up there. It's so good. And it is The Plant Paradox. Before we do that, I want to give a quick shout out to our show sponsor, Organifi. Now, I believe that every human being needs to be on a green superfood blend. Now, for me personally, growing up again, I had Flintstone vitamins. All right. This was my modus operandi of getting some vitamins and minerals in between my fish sticks and my macaroni and cheese, right? The Flintstone vitamins, and they were delicious. It was candy, all right? And today we just do adult versions of that. People are like, so uh, what vitamin should I take, right? What, what vitamin supplement should I get? Probably none, all right? Where does it come from? Is it synthetic? Is this earth-grown nutrients? Is it actually giving your, your body the things that your cells can actually recognize? And these are fundamental questions to ask because we can literally be peeing our money right down the toilet, all right? And some of these vitamins do make your pee like really weird colors, if you've ever noticed this. Now, so for me, I utilize Organifi because it's cold process and they have some of the most incredible and researched, well-researched superfoods in this blend. We're talking about spirulina, which has, it's literally been used for thousands of years by cultures in uh, Mexico and Chad, for example, as their primary protein source in some instances, because it's so dense in proteins, about 71% protein by weight, also a great source of beta carotene and phycocyanin, which is clinically proven to induce something called stem cell genesis. Really crazy. That's creating more stem cells. Really powerful stuff. But again, you need to be careful about sourcing with all these things. Chlorella, 
Um, they also have ashwagandha in there too, which this is one of the top things in Ayurvedic medicine for a reason. Again, thousands of years of documented history. It's great for helping you to modulate stress. So check them out. And oh, here's the most important thing. It actually tastes good. All right. I've been the guinea pig. I've tried out a couple dozen green superfood blends myself personally. Don't do this to yourself. Just go with what works, go with what tastes good. And my kids love it as well. And actually, you know, both of my kids had it today. So head over, check them out. You get 20% off your entire purchase forever, all right? Go to Organifi.com forward slash model. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash model for 20% off. Now let's get to the iTunes review of the week. Another five-star review titled, It's Official, I'm a Lifer by Miles Lover 23 Hi, Sean. I'm new to the community, but I have been loving all the awesome interviews and guest speaks. Wonderful content coming from you and many of my favorite speakers each and every time. But today's message, six crucial keys to long-term motivation, was a deep dive into something that as I start my journey to a healthier life is essential. The difference between motivation and inspiration and the importance of each in living out our goals. Wow, well done. I'm going to listen to it again and take notes. As the title suggests, I will be making the model health part of my motivational team for the long haul. Thanks so much for all you do, and I look forward to your future videos. Best at the journey to better. Oh my goodness, I absolutely love that. Thank you so much for sharing that with me. And he's referring to, if you guys haven't checked out the episode, we talked about the science of motivation and really did a deep dive into that. So I'll put that in the show notes for you. And uh, wow, just thank you so much for sharing that message. And everybody, thank you for heading over to iTunes and leaving us these reviews. Please keep them coming if you've yet to do so. Just pause this. I'm here on demand. I'll be here when you get back. Go leave me a review. And I truly, truly do appreciate that. And now let's get to our special guest and our topic of the week. Our guest today is Dr. Stephen Gundry. And he's a renowned cardiologist, New York Times bestselling author, and medical researcher. During his 40-year career in medicine, he's performed over 10,000 heart surgeries and developed life-saving medical technology as well. In 2008, his book, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution, revealed a new career shift for him, helping patients to heal themselves and avoid surgery through diet. His second book, the New York Times bestseller, The Plant Paradox, outlines a 90-day plan for some of the world's most pressing health issues from obesity to heart disease. Gundry, MD, co-founded by Dr. Gundry himself in 2016, is a wellness blog that you guys definitely need to check out, YouTube channel and supplement company to equip people with powerful tools in reclaiming their health. And he practices medicine at his Center for Restorative Medicine and International Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs and Santa Barbara, California. And I'd like to welcome to the Model Health Show, Dr. Stephen Gundry. How are you doing today? John, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Very, very grateful to have you on and excited to talk with you. As I mentioned, your book, holy moly, so good, so good. I would love to know, just to kind of get things started for people, obviously, you know, you're, you're changing a lot of lives right now, but what changed yours? What got you interested in this whole field of health and wellness in the first place? Well, I'll try to capsulize it. Uh, I had a special major at Yale University as an undergraduate back in the dark ages. And in those days, we could actually design our own major. And wow. so I had a, for four years, I got to research a, a thesis that you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply and its environment, and you could predict that you'd arrive at a modern human being. And uh, I was able to defend my thesis and uh, all 185 pages of it. And then I gave it to my parents and uh, <laughs> went off to medical school yeah. and became a very famous heart surgeon and children's heart surgeon and uh, transplant surgeon. Yeah. So I became famous for operating on people that nobody else wanted to operate on. And uh, back in about 1997, a um, guy was sent to me from Miami, Florida by the name of Big Ed. And Big Ed uh, was 48 years old. He had all of his coronary arteries were clogged up. You couldn't, you couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypasses. And he, like lots of people, would go around to the major centers 
uh, Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, uh, Houston, Stanford. And I was part of that circle because I was chairman at Loma Linda University here in Southern California. And Big Ed had been six months going to these places and everybody turned him down. And he arrived at my doorstep and I looked at his angiogram, the movie of his heart from six months earlier, and I said, you know, I don't like to turn people down, but Ed, I got to tell you, uh, I'm not going to help you. And he says, well, wait a minute. He says, I've, I've been on a diet for the last six months. Now, this is a guy who was 265 pounds when I'm talking to him. That's why his name's Big Ed. And he says, you know, I've lost 45 pounds uh, and I've gone to a health food store and I've taken all these supplements. And he literally brings in a big shopping bag full of supplements. And he says, you know, maybe I did something in here. And I'm going, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to do anything to your heart. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine uh, because... I obviously attended the same nutrition class that you did in college and medical school. <laughs> and, uh, and I was literally taught that this stuff makes expensive urine. So uh, he says, well, come on. What would it hurt to get another angiogram? Movie of my heart. I said, okay. So we get another catheterization. And in six months' time, this guy cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his coronary artery. Wow. Six months. Wow. And now he's got places that I could do bypasses. Now, I was pretty dumb then, so what I did was I did a five-vessel bypass on him, and he, he did great. If I knew what I knew now, I would have said, hey, great, you know, 50% are gone, you know, let's keep at this. But right. I didn't know that at that time. So... I'm a researcher, and after we're done, I said, so, you know, tell me about this diet you've been on. And he starts telling me what he's doing. And I, two sentences in, I go, wait a minute, time out. I said, this is my thesis in college, that, mm. you know, you, you are what you eat, and you are what the thing you're eating ate. And now why that's so poignant was that I was 70 pounds bigger than I am today, and I was running 30 miles a week. I was going to the gym one hour eight every day. And I was eating a low-fat, healthy, uh, vegetarian diet because uh, Loma Linda is an Adventist uh, health institution and vegetarian. So here I was, this big guy, exercising my brains out. And I had high cholesterol, high blood pressure, pre-diabetes. I had arthritis so bad I had to wear braces on my knees to run. And... I had migraine headaches when I do baby heart transplants and going, oh my goodness, you know, I'm doing everything right. How come everything's so wrong? So I, I called my parents in San Diego. I said, hey, you still have my thesis? And they said, oh, yeah, you know, it's here in the shrine next to the eternal flame. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I said, send it up to me. So I, I put myself on the program that I had described in college and I lost 50 pounds my first year, and I've subsequently lost another 20 pounds. But here's the best part. I said, hey, let me look in those bag of supplements of yours. So I start, you know, going through his jars of supplements. And I'm, I'm very famous for keeping hearts alive um, in a bucket of ice water for 48 hours after they've been dead for several hours. And I was putting in this concoction of stuff through the veins and arteries of the heart to resuscitate the heart muscle. And when I started looking through his bag of supplements, a lot of these supplements I was giving intravenously to resuscitate heart muscle. Interesting. And it never occurred to me to swallow the dumb things. <laughs> and so I started swallowing a bunch of supplements and I started sending my blood work up to Berkeley, California. And all of a sudden, my, you know, my high blood pressure went away, went away, my cholesterol normalized, my migraine headaches went away. And so I started doing this with my staff at Loma Linda, and I started doing this with patients that I operated on. And they all got better. And their diabetes went away. And we took them off their high blood pressure medicines. And their arthritis went away. So after about a year of doing this, I looked at myself one day in the mirror on a Friday, my wife never forgets it. She calls it Black Friday. 
And I said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I can't operate on people when I know that I could teach them how to eat and tell them to go get some supplements. And, you know, I shouldn't cut people open. Uh, so I resigned my position wow. and headed out to Palm Springs and opened my door and said, uh, here's the deal. Uh, I'll teach you how to eat. And all I ask you to do is every three months, I want to draw a bunch of blood work on you that Medicare will pay for, insurance will pay for, and I want to see what happens. And I want to tweak. And so that resulted in my first book, uh, like you mentioned, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. And then after we did that, a lot of people with autoimmune diseases started showing up in my doorstep. And today, about half of my practice is autoimmune disease. Mm. And so we started tweaking more and more with the foods that people were allowed, and that's probably what we'll talk about today. But long story short, uh, autoimmune disease comes from the gut, and it comes from the foods that we eat. And that resulted in my current book, The Plant Paradox. And The Plant Paradox is basically... Plants are good for us, but plants, certain plants are incredibly bad for us. And mm. so I'll stop there for a second yeah. and we'll go from there. Yes. And therein lies the paradox, you know, and how you outline this in the book. And, you know, you made a, a point of reference to stop many times and say, hey, I'm not anti-plant, right? And, but you also need to understand these basic principles that are many times ancestors knew about that have just somehow or another got lost in the shuffle. And so we're definitely gonna talk about those things today. So I think it would be great first and foremost to lay a foundation for everybody who's going to discover how highlighting uh, these certain plants, they aren't just inert organisms that can't do anything, right? Plants can't get up and run from you. Right. So you think that they're not living and they don't have this kind of consciousness to try to take care of themselves. So let's talk about that first and foremost, and the fact that these aren't inert organisms that can't do anything to protect their livelihood. What can plants do to defend themselves? Yeah, so, you know, plants were here first, and they, they had it really good. They were actually here for 90 million years before their predator arrived, which was insects. Now, if you think about it, plants had it great because nobody wanted to eat them, and Believe it or not, plants do not want to be eaten. They are subject to the same evolutionary pressures that animals are. They want to grow, and they want to make babies, their seeds, and they want to make sure their babies grow. So when their predators arrive, plants had a real problem because, like you mentioned, they, they can't run, they can't hide, they can't fight. But what they are is chemists of incredible ability. I mean, they can turn sunlight into matter, and we haven't figured out how to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So what they do is basically chemical warfare. And they have a variety of dis uh, pl proteins uh, at their disposal. And one of the ones I really focus on in the book are called lectins. Some people think I'm saying leptin, the anti-hunger hormone. Some people think I'm saying lecithin, the emollient, but it's lectin. So lectins are proteins that are sometimes called sticky proteins because they actually go after certain sugar molecules. And the idea of a lectin is to disrupt cellular communication, particularly in their original predator, was, which was an insect. And one of the cool things about lectins is they'll actually bind to a sugar molecule that is between nerve endings. It's called sialic acid, and there's not going to be a test, so don't worry. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and, and it disrupts one nerve talking to another. And so the insect would be paralyzed, and that's a pretty good deterrent. Right. As as animals got used to these things, there became an escalating warfare. Uh, give you an example, a great example. So young leaves of trees don't have very many lectins in them. And then as they get mature, the lectin content goes up. So caterpillars actually hatch 
in the springtime when the new leaves are coming out because they don't have as many lectins. And they don't hatch in the middle of the summer because the plant has mature lectins. But get this, if a caterpillar starts munching on one side of a tree, within 10 minutes, the other side of the tree will increase its lectin protection tenfold. So plants actually know what's happening to them. And we talk about in the plant paradox how you can actually stimulate the noise of a caterpillar. Right. And the plant will actually increase its lectin production only to that noise of a caterpillar munching, and it won't do it to a similar vibration. Right. So these guys, plants are really smart. One of the things that really amazed me a number of years ago is Michael Pollan's first book was actually called The Botany of Desire. It was actually how plants manipulate their uh, predators to do their bidding. And it had an amazing effect on me that, in fact, plants aren't just sitting there waiting to take it. They are sentient beings. And, you know, I am a plant predator, I admit it. But you got to know, <laughs> yeah. you, you got to know which plants you're actually evolved to eat and which plants you're absolutely not evolved to eat. And that's what the plant paradox does. Right, right. And so many different levels. And there's some stuff in between, too. There's a little bit of gray area as well that you address in the book. And the the one study, and you just mentioned it, they actually simulated the caterpillar munching. And they also put that up against, like, the wind blowing very hard. And there was no increase in the production. And you put in the book some mildly toxic mustard oils, just when they think the caterpillar yeah. is starting to bite on the leaf the plant will start to produce more protection. It's just mind-blowing stuff. And you also mentioned, uh, you know, the plants have their babies as well, which are these seeds. So let's talk about some of the different ways that uh, plants ensure that their babies can live on. Yeah, great question. So plants have a, a strategy and to make sure their babies make it. And there's, there's essentially two types of seeds that plants make. One, the plant protects its baby with a hard outer shell, uh, kind of like an M&M. &M. Um, so mm -hmm. the shell is actually indigestible by whoever eats them. And the plant actually wants the animal to eat that baby. And then the baby is going to pass through the intestines of the animal, and the animal is going to walk off. And then the animal is going to take a crap and going to deposit that baby a bit of ways away from the mother plant with a generous dollop of fertilizer. And so most fruits actually utilize that strategy. The plant wants you to eat that fruit, so you'll swallow its babies. And it wants you to eat lots of those fruits. And as I talk about in the book, the plant actually induces us to eat as many fruits as possible. Uh, number one, by telling us the color mm -hmm. of the fruit. And most of us don't realize that the only animals that have color vision are actually fruit predators. Uh, great apes have color vision because they are fruit predators. You and I have it because we are great apes. Uh, birds have color vision. And interestingly enough, dogs don't have color vision because they could care less what color a squirrel is. Uh, <laughs> if it's running, if the, if it's running, they want to eat it. Uh, and in fact, they they look for movement, and that's why a rabbit or a cat freezes when a dog goes by because the dog can't see the cat or the rabbit if it's not moving. So, cat plants again, how smart they are! They actually use red colors, yellow colors, orange colors to tell us that the sugar content is at its maximum and that we'll benefit from it. But it also tells us that the baby is now encased in a hard shell that we can't digest. So uh, the reason, for instance, General Mills and Kellogg's uses orange and yellow and red packaging right. and most snack food companies use this 
is because that actually hits our brain and says, oh, wow, it's fruit season and we should mm. be eating as much of this stuff as we can. Wheaties, cool, huh? Wheaties, Cheerios, Wheaties. Honey Nut Cheerios. Yes. All use those colors. The, that's built into my my mental Rolodex because my stomach is growling. I'm a little bit, I feel a little bad saying it, but uh, many a Honey Nut Cheerio hath passed, doth pass my lips in my day. So that's so crazy. I never thought about that. Yeah, I used to love Camp Captain Crunch. But think about it. Marketers know that if you're hauling your kid down the aisle in the snack food section or in the cereal section, those colors are going to hit this deep ingrained place in your brain and says, oh, wow, this is where we should be getting calories and mommy buy this for me. Mm, and I can't right. understand why you're not buying this for me. Yes. Yeah. I think that's the main place that the, the, the temper tantrum takes place is the grocery store for a lot of folks. So yeah. you mentioned, obviously, you know, that's one transportation method or, or kind of survival for the babies. And then also, what do we have? So there are a lot of plants that don't want their babies to be carried out someplace. They want to have them drop and stay. And those in general are the grasses and beans. And these they're usually in open fields. They want to drop. The next generation wants to go exactly where mom lived. And so these are what I call in the book naked babies. They don't have a hard protective shell. But instead, what they have is a outer hull that contains primarily what are called lectins that are designed to make the animal think twice about eating them by either making the animal hurt, by making the animal not thrive, by ma making the animal not reproduce well. And the smart animal says, you know, every time I eat these plants or the babies, uh, my allergies flare up, for example, for you, or uh, my joints hurt, uh, example for me, uh, or I get a migraine headache, and that's probably a really dumb thing to have. And I'm not going to eat these plant or plant babies anymore. I'm going to go do something else. In general, the plant won, the animal won, and everybody was happy. Now, then humans arrive. Now, unfortunately, humans are really stupid. And we'll eat these things and feel lousy or not thrive or have a migraine headache when you're doing a heart transplant and not realizing it's certain things that you're putting in your mouth that are causing this. And we'll take Aleve or Advil or we'll take Nexium or Prilosec or, and we'll just keep eating this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I'm trying to teach people is these are not things that are supposed to happen to you. Arthritis is not natural. Migraine headaches are not natural. Heartburn's not natural. I got news for you, heart disease is not natural. Mm -hmm. And when we look at cultures that have figured this out, you start seeing that they don't eat a lot of the things that we think are good for us. Right, and you outline that so well in the book. And I would love to talk a little bit more before we get some to some of the specific foods, and it's probably gonna surprise a lot of people where we're gonna find uh, these concentrations of lectins in some of these different foods. A lot of people today, obviously, wheat is the big, uh, the one with the big billboards. You know, people are talking about that. But there are several other things in wheat besides the lectins that the plant is using as a deterrent. So let's talk about a few of those, you know, the tannins and phylates, things like that. Yeah, so lectins are just one part of the defense system. And there are phytates, which actually are really well designed to prevent you from absorbing proteins and absorbing minerals. And interestingly enough, there are animals that are really designed to be predators of grains. So for instance, rodents. Rodents are grain predators. And one of the things I point out in my book is that rodents in general have 10 times the amount of what are called proteases that break down these anti-animal compounds. And we don't have them, which is another example for the fact that we have not evolved to be good predators for these plants and plant babies like wheat. 
The other thing that's really scary uh, about wheat, everybody knows about gluten. Uh, gluten happens to be a lectin, and it's a, it's a real lectin, but in the scheme of things, gluten is actually, in my book, down the list of the major lectins. Mm. And actually, the hull of wheat contains probably the worst lectin of all, which is called wheat germ agglutinin. It's nicknamed WGA. And wheat germ agglutinin is in the hull. It's not in the endosperm, the white part. So the advice to eat whole grain or whole wheat or whole brown rice is actually one of the biggest mistakes we've ever made. And because traditional cultures have tried to mill off the hull. For instance, four billion people use rice as their staple, but four billion people use white rice as their staple, and they've been getting rid of the hull of brown rice for 8,000 years. And mm. the same way the French use white flour, they have white baguettes, they have white croissants. The Italians, they have white pasta. I mean, the idea of whole wheat pasta is, is such an anathema to an Italian, and yet now in the tourist areas of Italy, you see whole wheat pasta. And you're, and you're right, it, it tastes awful. And <laughs> the Italians have been throwing the hull away for, you know, generations, because that's where one of the big problems is. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up, because uh, the, the French paradox, and you talked about this in the book, uh, we see about half the rate of heart disease with the French who are eating the foods that you just talked about. And also, and you mentioned this as well, they live about two and a half years longer on average. So it's just like, let's look at the results. And you mentioned 4 billion people. So we're talking about uh, countries in Asia, for example, uh, Japan, China, India, same thing. And this was a big revelation for me personally, because I remember the last kind of fast food-ish meal that I had. I literally remember this. And this was over 15 years ago. And it was at this Chinese restaurant, which is kind of like a fast food kind of Chinese restaurant. And I was sitting there and I was eating my whatever, hot braised chicken, whatever. And I saw that the owners, like their their family, you know, there's like their kids and, and their wife were eating like white rice and vegetables. And I was like looking at my plate and looking at theirs. And I was just thinking, I need to eat brown rice with this because I was trying to get healthy. And you just like look at the results. They figured this out a long time ago. And they're not eating this stuff that I'm eating. The messed up part is that they were selling it to me. But, you know, in the grand scheme of things, again, <laughs> somebody figured this out thousands of years ago that this could be a potential issue. Yeah, it, it, you know, what beginning in college, what I did was, you know, study why people did the things they did to the food they ate. And, you know, was it tradition or, you know, why did they do this? I mean, for instance, like quinoa, like I talk about in the book, the Incas had three detoxification processes to get the toxins out of quinoa. They would soak it for 48 hours and then they would ferment it. They'd let it rot and then they'd cook it. And it's not on the package directions. Mm, and right. as I, I, talk, I talk about it in the book, uh, and I've now seen this several more times since the book came out. Uh, I had a lovely 40-year-old woman who moved from Lima, Peru to L.A., and she wanted to continue her traditional diet, which contained a lot of quinoa. And her mother had always pressure cooked her quinoa, and she thought it was just this, you know, wives' tale. So when she moved to L.A., she started eating quinoa, not pressure cooked. And she got horrible, irritable bowel and just felt awful. And a friend convinced her to come out to visit me. And, you know, I'm going down the list, and I said, okay, now quinoa is so toxic. Uh, and she said, what? And I said, yeah, quinoa's toxic. you got to pressure cook it. And she said, wait a minute, my, my mother just flew from Lima two weeks ago and said, you stupid girl. She took her to Bed Bath & Beyond and bought her a pressure cooker. Mm -hmm. And she said, didn't I tell you, you have to pressure cook quinoa because it's so bad for you if you don't? And she said, you're telling me my mother was right? And I said, oh, yeah. I said, call me back in a month. And so she called me back. She said, yeah, you and mom are right. It was the pressure cooker. <laughs> and just last week, I, I saw a woman... Uh, from Brazil, 
who, uh, up until they were 11 years old, her mother always pressure cooked her rice and beans. And then their pressure cooker broke and mm -hmm. they stopped pressure cooking the rice and beans. And she said, I can tell you the day that all my health issues started. It was the day my mother stopped pressure cooking rice and beans. She said, I started developing allergies. I lost my tonsils. I you know, got an autoimmune disease. And she said, I read your book. And she said, holy cow, it was like somebody turned on a light bulb. And she said, it was the day our pressure cooker broke. And so now she's fine again. But it was a great story. Yeah. And uh, so there you go. That's so pressure profound. cooking kills, pressure cooking breaks lectins. It won't break the gluten lectins. So don't go home and pressure cook your, you know, brown rice or, or your wheat. It won't work, but it'll, it'll kill all other lectins. Wow. Also, you know, first of all, this is going to be a paradigm shift for people because it, a lot of people are like team quinoa. It's the, and they don't, they might even say it's quinoa, whatever they call it. But just like, oh, this is the greatest. The it's the ancient grain, right? The marketing is so fantastic. But you mentioned that it doesn't have the instructions on there on how it's traditionally used. Yes, it's been used a long time, but we got a little bit skewed here in our approach to it. And so, even for myself personally, I always soak it, and it gets sprouted, and then you cook it as well. You know, and even seeing different cultures who have had the great opportunity to work with people from all over the world, and seeing how many cultures ferment these type of foods, these grains, you know, and making breads and things like yeah, that as well. That's exactly right. Uh, fermentation, bacteria and yeast are very effective at eating lectins. So believe it or not, we have bacteria that are perfectly capable of digesting gluten. And if you, interestingly enough, if you go on a gluten-free diet, those bacteria have nothing to eat and they, and they leave our guts. And then you take a person who is only marginally sensitive to gluten, and then reintroduce gluten after they've gone gluten-free, and they'll really feel the gluten because the bacteria that were protecting them uh, were actually are gone. And that's another thing we talk about in the book. We have multiple layers of protection against these plant compounds that we've evolved. So. Plants have their system, and you know it's it's like setting up a, an NFL lineup. You know, we okay. Let's talk about the offensive line, and okay, now let's set up the defense. And we have these multiple layers of really yin and yang warfare between plants and animals. And the longer we we study traditional cultures and figure out, okay, how did they do this? And fermentation was a huge part of this, and Breads still in Europe are always raised with yeast or sourdough cultures. And people have to realize that breads in the United States and North America, now we don't use yeast to raise breads anymore. We use an agent called transglutaminase, which is really nasty stuff. Right. But that's right. a whole other subject. Yes. And all of this stuff is in the book. And I'm so glad that we're talking about this because I want to talk about for people, because this is a big paradigm shift when you start to think about, wait a minute, I'm a plant predator. Plants don't want to be eaten. And you start to become more conscious of these things because, you know, you might have that same uh, perspective with animal foods, but this can be a real paradigm shift. But the question is, what are our defenses? And we're going to talk about what those are right after this quick break. So sit tight and we'll be right back. Today, we're in the midst of a new revolution with our understanding of food. We used to just be focused on this macronutrient paradigm, proteins, fats, carbohydrates. Carbohydrates and proteins got a pretty good name, but fats were drugged through the mud. Why is that? Because it's called fat, all right? The name implies something different than the other two. Because when we hear the word fat, we think about fat on our bodies. Fat in food and fat in our bodies are two totally different things. And it's like thinking, if I eat blueberries, I'm going to turn blue. When you think that eating fat is going to turn you fat. It just doesn't work like that. And any of those three macronutrients can actually put fat on your body if you eat too much or the wrong types. Healthy fats, which I'm proposing that we start to call lipids or even energy, are incredibly important for every single function in your body. Your cells, every single cell in your body, we have upwards of 100 trillion cells that make you up. 
require fats to just maintain the integrity of your cell membranes. We're talking about the thing that holds your cells together and enables your cells to communicate. It's very important. Also your brain, your brain is mostly fat and water. This is why fats are so important. When you're deficient in fats, especially the right kinds of fats, you can see some big issues. So in order to address that, some of my favorite things today are MCT oils. And specifically, if we look at emulsified MCT oils that actually taste amazing. And these are medium chain triglyceride oils that are extracted from things like coconut or palm. And these medium chain triglycerides have a thermogenic effect on the body, which means they are able to positively alter your metabolism. All right, that's number one, thermogenic effect from MCT oils, positively altering your metabolism. Number two, MCTs are more easily absorbed by your cells. So unlike conventional food of any type that has to go through a pretty arduous process of digestion, turning that food stuff into you stuff, MCTs are able to go directly to your cells and provide almost instant energy. Number three, MCT oils are very protective of your microbiome. There's so much research today about the importance of having a healthy microbiome and the integrity of our gut. MCT oils are one of those things that help to support that because they're especially effective at combating viruses, parasites, bacteria. And there's so much goodness that is able to be found in these MCT oils, but you wanna get the good stuff. And for me, that's why I go to onit.com forward slash model. That's O-N-N-I-T.com forward slash M-O-D-E-L to get the emulsified MCT oils, which is like a coffee creamer. These are great to add to your coffees and teas, smoothies and things like that to get in a little bit of extra flavor plus all the benefits of MCT oils. They're easy to stir so you don't have to throw everything into a blender just to get a nice coffee drink, but also they taste good and they make the process of being healthy, fun and enjoyable. So head over, check them out. They've got vanilla, coconut, cinnamon swirl, and strawberry. It's one of my favorites. So go to onit.com forward slash model for 10% off your entire purchase, not just for the MCT oil, but all of the health and human performance supplements that Onit carries and all of their fitness equipment, gear, and so much other cool stuff. All right, head over there, check them out, onit.com forward slash model. Now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're talking to the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Plant Paradox. Dr. Stephen Gundry. And before the break, we were going to talk about our personal lines of defense because plants have them. What are the four lines of defense for us? Because you said it like it's setting up the offensive line. We've got the defensive backs and that kind of thing. So how are we able to protect ourselves? And by the way, I said offensive line and defensive backs. I meant running back. All right. Fullback. This is my son plays that position, by the way. And so aha, what aha. are our four lines of defense? Yeah, you would have been in big trouble with your son, you know. <laughs> Dad, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> so, first line of defense is mucus. Now, I mentioned to you that lectins are proteins that look for sugar molecules. And mucus is mucopolysaccharides. Polysaccharides means lots of sugar. And so mucus actually traps lectins. And next time you bite into a jalapeno pepper and your nose starts to run, realize that your nose is running because you have sensed lectins and you are producing mucus to trap them. Now, mucus, yeah, so uh, it's called gustatory rhinorrhea. Now, there's a, another great line I uh, can't help but using. Uh, <laughs> there are no animals that would take a second bite of a jalapeno pepper. Or a ghost Except, pepper. Uh, There's ghost pepper uh, challenges. Ghost pepper. I don't know if you've seen these, Dr. Gundry. It's insane. It's insane. I, I Before I, I, I grew up, I used to do a lot of crazy ghost pepper challenges and wondered why I had arthritis and things like that. But that's another subject. Uh, birds don't react to these things, and that's why they're called bird chilies, because birds are the only mm, animals that are adapted to eating chilies. By the way, a chili pepper is an American nightshade family, so uh, we're not designed to eat them. Sorry about that. So mucus traps lectins. Mucus lines our entire GI tract. And those of you who have heartburn, I can guarantee you that it's because you're eating major lectin-containing foods that have actually absorbed the mucus that protects your 
esophagus from acid. And I used to have horrible heartburn, and I don't anymore because I now have my mucus layer intact. Mucus also protects the lining of your gut. And number two in our defense system is actually acid in our stomach. Now, acid is really good at, believe it or not, breaking down protein. That's what it's there for. And lectins are a protein. So a lot of lectins are digested by acid. So that's number two. Three. Three is bacteria in our gut. I mentioned before that the bacteria in our gut are actually pretty doggone good at eating lectins if they've evolved to eat them. Now, the longer you're exposed to a plant and its lectins, the longer you have in place bacteria that have evolved to like to eat those plants. Uh, we actually have to have bacteria to digest plants. No animal can digest plants, not even a termite. Termites have to have little bitty bacteria to digest the wood they eat. So bacteria are incredibly important. And as I talk about in the book, we've decimated our defensive line of bacteria with injuries. Injuries from antibiotics, injuries from the NSAIDs, Advil and Aleve. It actually blows holes in our gut. And all of our animals have been fed antibiotics one way or another. And we've decimated our bacteria with Roundup, that herbicide that's used on plants to kill them. So the final line of defense is actually a mixture of bacteria and mucus that line our gut wall. And we have certain bacteria that actually stimulate mucus production on the lining of our gut. And without those bacteria, we don't make mucus. And if we don't have mucus, then lectins actually make leaky gut. And I can tell you that almost every one of us has some degree of leaky gut now. And I used to think it was a myth. And I can tell you that I see it now every day. Everyone with autoimmune disease has a leaky gut. And uh, we can repair our leaky gut with high dose vitamin D and lots of fish oil, but primarily by getting lectins out of our diet. Wow, wow, wow. This is, there's so much good stuff here. Um, I think that, and just to uh, backpedal a little bit, um, when you talked about the quinoa earlier, for example, and, uh, you know, there's, there's certain compounds, even like uh, the saponins that are in quinoa. These are like soap-like yep. sugar molecules yep. that can cause you this irritation. So I'm wondering, and it, but there's a hack for that. So I know people are like, Dr. Gundry, bro, can I not eat spicy food? So what is it that, what are some of the foods, how do we actually attack this situation when we're so used to our way of being? How do we approach this so that we can eat foods that we enjoy and still feel good? Yeah, okay. So again, one of the things that I try to convince people is that all of us in America are not from America. Um, mm. Donald Trump is wrong. We're from <laughs> Europe, Asia, or Africa, all of us. We're all from someplace else. And that means that none of our ancestors were exposed to American plants until 500 years ago when Columbus started trade. And some of our most beloved foods are actually American plants that we really have no business eating, or if we want to eat them, we have to hack and mm. so there are the nightshades. There are potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, goji berries. Believe it or not, goji berries are from America. They were taken to China in trade. Then there are the squash family, cucumbers, zucchinis, pumpkins. Peanuts and cashews are American beans. They're some of the worst things you can eat. And chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds are American seeds. So what do you do to these guys? Well, traditional cultures, for instance, the Italians refused to eat tomatoes for 200 years because they knew how deadly they were. Mm. Italians always peel and de-seed their tomatoes before they make sauce. And uh, by the way, I just got sent a bottle of tomato sauce from an American company that peels and de-seeds their tomatoes. And so this is beginning to catch on. Wow. 
So peel and deseed your tomatoes. Peel and deseed your peppers. The Southwest American Indians always char their chili peppers and peel and deseed them before they grind them into chili. Tabasco sauce and most traditional peppers are fermented. The fermentation eats the lectins. So you know, ferment your foods or buy a preparation that's already fermented. Last but not least, a pressure cooker will destroy lectins. So uh, I have a wonderful story of a woman uh, in the book who had horrible migraines. And she had a big garden and she loves a zucchini and tomato relish. Just loved it. But she had horrible migraines. So we got rid of her to tomato and zucchini relish and her migraines went away. And she says, oh, but I love my, I love my zucchini and tomato relish. I just love it. I, I don't care if I get migraines. I said, I'll tell you what, can it this next year, can it regularly and pressure cook it. Call me back. So she took a couple bites of her regular stuff, got a migraine, went away. A couple days later, she takes a bite of her pressure cooked zucchini and tomato relish, no migraine. And now, now she's, of course, eating her fresher cooked zucchini and tomato relish, and she's happy. So she just learned the hack that allowed her to eat her food. And again, the, the person who learned the hack that a pressure cooker makes beans safe. We've had several vegan authors attack me that I'm anti-grain and anti-bean. I'm not at all. I'm just telling you, you're stupid to eat them in their natural form. You got to make them, you got to get through the lectins and kill them with a pressure cooker. I'll eat all the beans in the world if you pressure cook them. <laughs> there you have it. I love it. I love it. You know, because again, I'm almost over here cheering. I like, I like spicy food, but these are some things that I learned about a long time ago. And I remember um, I was at this restaurant and you know you always do what the other kids do and this was maybe i don't know 10 years ago and it was a ghost pepper and it was so hot literally the 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 chef brought out a plate with a small circle the size of maybe a raisin of the juice or the fluid from this pepper and then he passed out some toothpicks i'm like what is going on guys because they've seen this before and so I, I see what they're doing. They dip it in and they put it on their tongue. And I'm like, okay, again, the other kids are doing it. So I do this and I put it on my tongue and it felt like I was getting a tattoo on my skin. Like it was so hot. And today understanding that these are the defense mechanisms in the plant. You're, you're not supposed to feel good when you have it. However, we can still utilize some of these things in creative and novel ways, but just adhering to the way that our ancestors might have done it. And it's so enlightening to hear this because for most of us, Dr. Gundry, as you know, we are unaware of the fact that some of these foods are hurting us and causing disease. And I would love also if we can address, because in, I've said this, I've been saying this for about 10 years too, and your thesis was on this. So somehow it trickled down to me that it's not just you are what you eat, it's you are what you eat ate. And so you share stories of people who are eating what they think to be free range chicken and having some of these same issues. So let's talk about that. How is this happening? Yeah, so uh, let's use chicken as an example. So chickens are insectivores. They were actually brought to farms from Southeast Asia. And chickens, I, I grew up in the Midwest, and chickens would go out to the cow fields and they'd dig through cow pies, cow manure, looking for bugs. And they'd actually distribute the manure. And then they'd come back to the hen house and they'd lay eggs and you'd, never eat a chicken until the old hen couldn't lay anymore and she became a stewing hen. In fact, Herbert Hoover's campaign slogan was a chicken in every pot, not in every fry pan. Because mm. uh, you can't, and so what happens is the chicken is designed to eat bugs and grass and that's what constitutes its flesh. If you feed chickens corn or soybeans, you will actually not have a chicken anymore. You will basically have a bird, uh, an ear of corn with feathers. <laughs> and one yeah. of the things that I read about a number of years ago that there will be lectins in the meat of these animals that are eating corn or soybeans or wheat that they weren't designed to eat and that we will react to them. And I, I really thought it was kind of, wow, that's really out there. 
until I started seeing these people with autoimmune diseases. And one of the most striking ones is a, is a woman who I actually saw recently again. She's a psychologist in LA who had horrible lupus, one of the autoimmune diseases. And she had all these rashes and she was on auto, uh, immune suppressive drugs and knew how bad those were. So we, we got her off of all of those and we took major lectins away from her. And I said, now look, if you're gonna eat chicken, eat a pastured chicken, chicken that went out and ate bugs. And she said, okay, got it. So we saw her back and all of her rashes went away, but she still had some eczema on her eyelids. Mm. So I'm going down the list of things and she's, you know, she's a saint and I get to chicken and I said, okay, now you're eating pastured chicken, right? She said, oh yeah, I eat organic free range chicken. I eat a lot of it. And I said, wait a minute. Organic means that they were fed corn and soybeans that were organic right. and free range means they were kept in a warehouse. And they were only let outside five minutes out of every day if they got out at all, because there's 100,000 chickens in the warehouse. And they open a door legally for five minutes a day. That's the definition of free range. And she said, oh, my gosh. I said, okay, go home. No more chicken. The only chicken you get is a pastured chicken. Calls me back a couple months later. She says, you're right. Eczema's gone. Uh, <laughs> that was it. Yeah. And I see this sadly all the time. A chicken is not a chicken anymore. Just like a cow that eats corn and soybeans is not a cow anymore. A pig that's fed corn and soybeans is not a pig anymore. And we have, just because these animals look like what they used to look like doesn't mean that their flesh is, is the same. These animals are fed, you know, Roundup on their wheat and their corn and their soybeans, and we know the Roundup is in them. Even if it says antibiotic-free, it's a lie. Uh, you probably heard recently of a natural food company in Georgia that was advertising antibiotic-free chicken, and 70% of the chickens still had antibiotics in their meat. So don't believe any of this stuff. Know your farmer, know what the animal is eating, and it makes a huge difference. Wow. That's enlightening. And also, again, these are calls to actions for us to figure out a new way to do things because the people that are listening, we have, for the most part, everybody has really taken action to become healthier, to do those steps to become a better version of ourselves. But sometimes there, there are missteps along the way, you know, just like when my initial forte was going from uh, white pasta to wheat pasta, you know? And so you've yep. been somebody yep. who's really been a great bridge for people to get right to the destination a lot faster. Are there any other insights for us to share as far as what our approach should be? Because you just mentioned uh, avoid the so-called quote free range and organic because it just means they're eating organic fake chicken food and go for the pasture. Are there any other insights that we need to adhere to that you can share with us today? Yeah, uh, watch out for organic farm-raised salmon. Uh, you'll see organic Scottish salmon, organic Norwegian salmon. These are farm-raised salmon, and they're fed organic grains. Don't fall into that trap. Now, on the other hand, try to eat organic vegetables as much as possible. But just remember, an organic pepper is no better for you because it's a nightshade unless you peel and deseed it. The other really important thing for people to realize is that a lot of people who work out think, well, I'm sore and I'm going to take an ibuprofen or a leave or an Advil and that'll be great. Yeah. Every time you swallow one of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, it is literally like swallowing a hand grenade and it will blow holes in the wall of your gut that lectins and bacteria will get through. And it's designed to actually relieve your pain, but then make you hurt more and you'll go looking for more pain relief. Drug companies know this. Uh, I show it in my book. There are better alternatives for relieving pain. So just be careful, particularly with your listeners who are you know, very interested in building uh, muscle and uh, no pain, no gain. <laughs> Be very careful. Be very suspicious about taking NSAIDs for pain relief. Love it. Love it. And you do talk about, 
you know, so many other factors in the book. There are seven deadly disruptors and just other key components that are outside the paradigm of typical diet books. So well written and so engaging and so much great information. Would you please let everybody know where they can find your book and where they can connect with more of your information online? Yeah, so, I mean, you can get it on Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Please go to your local bookstore. It's there. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for 13 weeks, so they got it. If you want more information, go to GundryMD.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. I've got a YouTube channel, GundryMD YouTube. We'll show you how to cook these things. Uh, the cookbook will be out in April, the Plant Paradox Cookbook, uh, with over 100 new recipes. But I'm always putting new recipes out. Uh, this can be done. It's uh, You get to hate me for a couple weeks, but then if you read the reviews on Amazon, you'll start loving me very soon. Um, and, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and thanks for having me on. Be happy to come back and chat some more at your convenience. Uh, I would love that. Dr. Gundry, this is, again, it's an amazing book, but you have an amazing story, and I got to hear more of it today myself. And you are one of the one of the very special, even though, you know, I know you probably have this belief that you're not special, and a lot of people can do what you've done, but in reality, you were somebody who asked questions. When your patient started to find a way, a solution that wasn't there before, you asked questions and you did something about it. And I just think that tra takes a tremendous amount of heart and compassion and wherewithal. And then to uh, have that Black Friday take place where, you know, where you made the decision, like, <laughs> I can't ethically do that work anymore. I'm going to focus on this. I'm just very uh, grateful for you making that decision and sharing your greatness with all of us. Well, I appreciate you. I'm like, my wife calls it Black Friday because, quite frankly, you can make a whole lot more money cutting people open than teaching them how to eat. Yeah. But I wouldn't change for the world because, you know, getting seeing thousands of people take their lives back and it's just you can't you can't pay for that. It's just, uh, you know, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I actually work seven days a week. I have office on the weekends as well. Because I just can't see enough folks and hear their stories. So amazing. Uh, good luck to you. And thank you for having me. And thank you for letting me reach a few more people. Awesome. My pleasure. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to the show today. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Again, I'm not just saying this. Uh, I've read countless books, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books. And specifically in, in fitness and nutrition and health. And this is one of my top 10 for sure, just jumped right up there on the list because of putting together, it's just such a great compilation of many of the things we've talked about over the years, but it's right there in this concentrated form that the everyday person can see this book and pick it up and have their life transformed. Uh, so I definitely recommend picking it up and also, of course, check out Dr. Gundry online. And if you're in the area, obviously, you know, he's, as you he mentioned, he's, he sees patients as well. You know, he's still in the trenches. He's still doing this good work. But he's doing this to a much greater degree and, and greater reward, as he described himself personally, but also the reward that people are seeing with their health transformed. And I don't think you can really put a price on that. And today we covered a lot of information. Probably some of these things might have pushed up against your belief system. And hopefully you have the compassion for yourself to trust the process, to open up and to, to think differently, to just allow for this to be a possibility that maybe the thing that you once believed in might be something that is taking you out in another form or fashion. You know, for us, it's just a process of becoming more aware. You know, I really do believe that awareness trumps everything. And the more that you can start to wake up and to see the world around you from a meta perspective and then be able to zoom in and to deal with the everyday stuff, the better, you know, because for us, our ancestors figured out a lot of these things. And because of industry, we kind of lost our way, you know, and he talks about this in the book as well, you know, uh, Kellogg jumping on the scene and really pushing into consciousness for a supposed good reason of regularity, like we need to eat more brown stuff so you can poop more, seeing our health just destroyed as a result of that, you know, maybe having a good ethical reason up front, but not knowing the full story. And today you got to hear more of the full story. So 
Thank you so much for tuning into the show today. Please share this out with your friends and family on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. And of course, you can tag me at Sean Model. I appreciate you so much for tuning into the show. Have a great day. Take care. And I'll talk with you soon.